Right. Uh, hello and uh, a very warm welcome uh, to the quantitative ability section of the GRE. Now, some of you might have completed your verbal ability, some of you are starting afresh. Please understand, uh, the quant section becomes a very, very important part of your GRE score because out of 340, if you want to reach your dream score of 320, 310, 330, the quant score becomes all the more important. You know, unless you score a 160, 170, it's not going to be very easy. We'll get to, you know, what is 160, what is 170 a little later. So, we'll uh, spend time today on uh, understanding the GRE quant section, the kind of questions asked, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, score analysis, you know, what kind of uh, scoring is there, uh, the topics that are there in GRE math, and what is the level of those topics, and how should one start preparation and all that. Apart from that, we'll also look at... Uh, if one wants to improve their calculation speed, because please understand, in any competitive exam, not just GRE, uh, time is very premium. So, you know, given uh, the same question paper and you are given unlimited time, I am sure most of us would crack it. But uh, in a competitive exam, what differentiates between a person with a good calculation ability and a person with uh, not a very good calculation ability is the speed at which you calculate. So, competitive exam is, is that is why very important. So, we will also look at how to improve our calculation speed and all that, right? So, let us first start with uh, understanding the GRE quant section. Now, uh, the GRE quant section, uh, much like the verbal section, has two subsections, which means you will have, uh, in other words, you will have to attempt two quant sections. The duration is 35 minutes. So, each subsection will have 35 minutes. So, together 35 plus 35 is 70. Please understand this 35 minutes is very specific to one subsection. You can't, uh, you know, carry over or take the time that you saved in one to the other, right? 35 minutes. Uh, now, this is about, uh, now these could occur at any point of time. You know, after the AWA part of your exam, um, you know, your verbal could start first or quant could start first. We cannot definitely say which will, which one will come first, right? This is about, uh, you know, what the section is, etc. And each subsection will have approximately 20 questions. Now, when I say approximately, there is no definite number. Uh, sometimes you might have slightly more than 20, sometimes you might have slightly less than 20, but approximately 20 in each subsection. So, we are looking at, in other words, 20 questions to be solved in about 35 minutes. Roughly speaking, about 2 minutes per question. 2 minutes to read the question, understand the question, solve the question and then mark your answer. Now, what you have to understand is, uh, GRE, you know, whether it is verbal or quant, is a sectional adaptive test. Now, what do we mean by a sectional adaptive? What do we mean by a sectional adaptive test is that, the first quant or the verbal section that is presented to your student will be of some medium difficulty level, because you know, uh, somebody who is conducting the test does not know whether I am clever, whether I am intelligent, whether I am dull, if he does not know who I am. So, before they start the test, they give you a, the first section will always be of medium difficulty. That means, neither very difficult, neither very easy. Now, based on your performance in that section, the next subsection will follow. So, the first subsection is always of a medium difficulty level. So, within a subsection, all these 20 questions, you know, we said approximately 20, these 20 will be of the same difficulty level, more or less. When I say same difficulty, it does not mean, you know, uh, very, very similar, but, you know, more or less, because sometimes some topics might be difficult or easy for me, it could be very different with you. So, what I am trying to tell you is more or less that the same difficulty level within that section. Now, based on your performance in this first subsection, the second subsection will follow. Now, what it means is, you have done very well in the first subsection, which means, you know, out of 20, let's say you got 18 right, 17 right. You would not know that, but the system will know which is right. Which means, the system will now understand, uh, you are very intelligent, and this particular section, the medium difficulty was very easy for you. So, what it uh, tunes itself, it adapts itself to your intelligence, which means, since you are more intelligent, the next section will be a difficult one. So, if you do very well in the first one, the next one, the next subsection that will follow will be of a, a greater difficulty level. And if you do not do well, if you score something like 5, 6, 7 questions right, it thinks probably, you know, you are not up to the level of these questions. So, the sec second section that will follow will have questions that are easier than this. So, this is what we mean by sectional adaptive. Questions within a subsection will be of more or less similar difficulty. And based on the performance of uh, 
of the student in the first subsection, the second subsection will follow. This is called sectionally adaptive. It's a computer adaptive test. Right. Now you might ask me, uh, if the second subsection is easy, then somebody might have a chance of uh, getting more right. Yes, you're absolutely right. But please understand, your score is will be directly proportional to the number of questions you get right, but also the difficulty level of the question that you answered. So it, it's, it, it does, not, does not just uh, take into account only the number of questions that, uh, that are right, but more importantly, the difficulty level is also taken into account. So don't worry too much about that, but give your best in the exam, right? This is about uh, sectional adaptive. Let us understand the scoring in these sections. Uh, now, GRE verbal score is 130 to 7, 170. Similarly, the quant score is also between 130 and 170. Now, what do you mean by 130 and 170? The minimum score is 130. So, which means if you get everything wrong, you'll get, you'll end up getting a 130. And the maximum score that is possible, that means students who get most right and the maximum score is 170 in one point increments. Now, what do you mean by one point increments? Somebody can get 131, 132, but not 132.5 or so on. So, in one point increments. Now, please don't assume this as, you know, between 130 and 170, let's say 40 marks and you have 40 questions. You know, you don't assume this as one mark per question. This is wrong. This is absolutely wrong. Please understand, this is a normalized score because students the world over are writing the exam in an online mode. So, you know, the kind of questions you get will be very different from the kind of questions I get. So, they what they do is they calculate something known as a raw score based on the number of questions you get right, then normalize. Now, what do we mean by normalize? Normalization is carried out uh, to make sure that it is a fair process. So, you know, somebody who gets difficult questions should be given more weightage. Somebody who gets easy questions should be given less weightage. All that process is called normalization. So, after all this, your score is given. So, minimum is 130 and based on your performance in both the sections, you will be given a score like 25, 30, which is added to your 130. So, between 130 and 170 is your score. Now, like we said in the beginning, if you want to score a 310, a 320, let's say a 310, if you end up getting 150 in verbal, please understand you need to get 160 in quant. Now, since we are used to doing math uh, since our childhood, uh, please maximize your score through quant. So, if you want to get a 320, 325, etc., etc., it's very important that you end up getting your 170 in quant, right? So, getting a 170 in quant is... Uh, not very easy like it used to be in the old pattern where getting 800 was very easy because there are newer type of questions, uh, there, are, there are tricks in you know the GRE, right? This is about the scoring. So target a 160, 165 to begin with in the beginning of the course. By the end of the course and you know, you, when you practice well, you should end up you know targeting a score of 170 and it's not very difficult. At the same time, it's not very easy. So you have to put efforts, right? Now. Uh, this is about the scoring, uh, the you know the kind of uh, sections sections you have, and how is the scoring, uh, how is it calculated, the timing, etc., etc. Now, another important thing in the GRE exam is that the presence of an online calculator, which means in the exam uh, while you are solving questions you will have an online calculator available to you. Now, when I say online calculator, it is a very, very basic calculator that is given to you. Uh, please don't assume that uh, it will have all the fancy functions that an engineering, that the scientific calculator might have. So, it is an online calculator with uh, very, very minimal functions like addition, subtraction, percentage, square root, etc. But, let us understand, in the GRE official guide itself, it is very clearly given that the calculator is given only to help or supplement your knowledge of math, not to replace your knowledge of math. Now, one bad habit that uh, you know you people might have picked up, especially during your graduation, is that the moment you have a calculator available, even for the smallest of calculations, start using that calculator. Please understand there is a great difference between a manual calculator and an online calculator. I mean in terms of the usage. So, you know, for you to start typing numbers, then, you know, type into or by or addition or subtraction and then finally get the answer, it takes a lot of time. Please understand that. And in that meanwhile, you might actually do the calculation faster on a piece of paper. And even if you type one number, uh, you know, if a mistake happens in typing one number, just imagine the, uh, the mistakes in the answer. 
So my suggestion to all of you is, and in fact this is what is given in the GRE uh, official guide as well from ETS, that 90% of your questions or 95% of your questions will not lead a calculator. So all your calculations are that simple. Use the calculator only when it is required. If there are difficult ones, for example, you know, there could be questions on data analysis where there could be some difficult calculations. Only in those cases, please use the online calculator. In other cases, never ever go touch the calculator, right? The, uh, trust your calculation speed, you have, you'll have your rough pen and paper, do it, right? So all through the course, uh, we'll try and not to use the calculator. Wherever needed, we'll tell you, please use the calculator so that you get a hang of, you know, what kind of problems are we solving and what kind of problems need a calculator and don't need a calculator. So this is about the presence of the online calculator, right? Now let us come to the syllabus of GRE math. Now, uh, some of you, you know, who are not from a math background, which means you stopped studying math after 10th, you know, went on to take by PC or, you know, some other subject, don't be worried. Please understand, GRE math tests a student of his knowledge or ability of all the topics that were studied in school. So starting from your 6, 7, 8, 9. So, you know, the basic arithmetic, basic geometry, etc. So it does not test anything beyond your 10th, so you should not be worried. My suggestion to all those who think, you know, you're not very good at math, you're scared of math and numbers, you know, the, the very word mathematics, you know, bring shivers down my spine. My, my big, my suggestion, sincere suggestion to all of you is please get hold of all the school textbooks, school math textbooks, starting from the 6th, 7th class up to the 9th, 10th class, go revise them once, you know, before uh, you kind of start doing the exercises in the book that will help you immensely so that you, you tr get to revise, get to understand what all topics we learnt in school we are just relearning them in a different manner, right? So please understand it is just restricted to school syllabus and those who think we are not good at math you need not be worried at all uh, trust me, it is a very easy exam but full of tricks we just have to get used to it and scoring it is very easy if you put in the right kind of effort Right, coming to the syllabus, so you will have questions from arithmetic. Now when I say arithmetic, you will have questions from numbers, so percentages and their applications, uh, ratio and average, then time, speed, distance, uh, time and work and all such things, you know, mixtures, allegations, etc. So, you'll have topics, uh, questions from arithmetic. You'll also have questions from algebra. So, when I say algebra, basic functions, variables and constants, uh, solving linear equations, you know, in one or two variables, maximum two variables, nobody will give you three variables, right? So, it will also be, you know, quadratic equations, something that you learnt in your school, very basic quadratic equations. So, this is something that you will have. In fact, you will also have progressions. So, you could club them either arithmetic or algebra, it does not matter. You will have basic progressions or uh, in the GRE language, you know, if you look at GRE language, it will be called as series questions, right? So, you will have arithmetic, you will have algebra. Right? Next. You will also have geometry. So, geometry could mean simple plane geometry, where we will talk about points, lines, angles, triangles, squares, rectangles, pentagons, etc. And we will also talk about coordinate geometry. So, what happens when you plot points on a plane, a two-dimensional plane, not a three-dimensional plane, but a two-dimensional plane? Then we will also look at solid geometry. Now, solid geometry is those basic shapes, cube, cuboid, a cylinder, a cone, what are their volumes, what are their surface areas, their applications in problems. Now, we will also have uh, a modern math. So, modern math is nothing but your set theory. permutations and combinations, then you will have uh, probability, 
right so this is your modern math then you'll also have questions from statistics right so statistics could be you know basic mean median mode and a couple of other uh, mm, ways of finding uh, you know the central tendencies we'll we'll get there when we get to statistics right broadly these are the five topics so arithmetic algebra geometry modern math and statistics this is about the syllabus so i hope you have noted it down so like i said you know all this that we have uh, learned so far this is something that was there in your school textbook something that you learned in your school right now let us look at the type of questions now we have seen the syllabus but let's look at the type of questions gre math part has four different type of questions let us look at each one of them the first one is an mcq now what is an mcq something that you have been learning for your uh, lifetime now a multiple choice question that means a question is followed by options you will have to choose the right option something that that does not need uh, any explanation the second one is a multiple answer question now what do i mean by this is a single question might have multiple answers now in the gre uh, you know we cannot surely tell you whether it has two answers or three answers or four answers uh, but we have to choose all those that are correct a partial answer won't be given so if you let's say there are three choices three right choices for a question and you tick only two you won't be given any score because you are not tick the right third one but in the question it will be clearly given if there are uh, uh, you know three or if there are four if there are two so you have to choose all the right ones it's a slightly difficult one compared to multiple choice because you need to be aware of each and every option then the third one is called numeric entry very very similar to our fill in the blanks in school which means a question is followed by a blank you have to type the answer so if what is 2 into 3 you have to type 6 so there are no choices so on this uh, these two are you know new question types in the revised pattern compared to the old pattern just to see if the students are actually understanding the topic you know or if they are just putting a b c d uh, if they are fluking so this is essentially to test that right so this is a numeric entry question now if you have to if the answer is a fraction and you have to enter fractions uh, you'll have a blank for a numerator you'll also have a blank for a denominator you have to type both and then finally you'll have a question on quantitative comparison so we'll look at uh, these new question types what they mean etc okay quantitative comparison these are the four question types multiple choice question multiple answer question numeric entry or the fill in the, the traditional fill in the blank the quantitative comparison question so your 20 questions could be a mix of all these but majority will be mcqs uh, about 5 to 6 in each of those 20 in each subsection could be this the remaining three or four questions could be these two so but majority will be mcq and quantitative comparison right so we'll look at a few examples for each of them and then uh, go ahead
right uh, let us now look at uh, the different kind of questions some examples some official examples from ets and then uh, move forward right uh, this is the guide that you can download from ets website free for up let us look at each type of the question this is the first kind of question something known as quantitative comparison now what do we mean by quantitative comparison now in these type of questions you will be given two quantities quantity a quantity a and uh, quantity b now you have to compare the values of quantity a and quantity b you just have to compare and say whether quantity a is greater or quantity b is greater or if both are equal or sometimes you may not be in a position to find the relation between the two with the given information so you have to choose between the four options very simple two quantities given one under a one under b you have to find out which of these is greater so for example in this question quantity a is 2 into 6 quantity b is 2 plus 6 which is greater very simple it is a for example look at this Lionel is younger than Maria. Twice Lionel's age and Maria's age. Now, if you, there are two people here, Lionel and Maria. Uh, assume Lionel's age is A and Maria's age is B. So let us do this. So, so Lionel's age, let it be A. Maria's age, let it be B. Uh, Lionel is younger, so A less than B. So, what are you comparing? Twice Lionel's age and Maria's age. So, twice Lionel's age will be two A, is quantity A, and what is Maria's age? It is B. Now, between two A and B, which is greater? Let us understand. When I say A is less than B, A could be anything. A could be five. For example, a could be five, b could be twenty. Even in this case, a is still less than b. So two times a, which is ten, is still less than b. Which means, if for example, a is five and b is twenty, two a is also less than b. Then you could say b is the answer. But will it be the case all the time? Not possible. Because if b is twenty, a could still be nineteen, and this relation will still hold good. What is the relation? A is less than b. But two times a now will be 38, which is greater than b. Which means, when I am saying Lionel is just younger than Maria, and we do not know by how much is she she younger by five years, six years, nine years, ten years, we can't be able to decide the relation between the given two variables. What are the two variables? Two parameters rather. One is twice Lionel's age and Maria's age. So the answer becomes D. You can't find the relationship with the information given. So it becomes D. So this is how you need to find out. For example. 54% of 360 and 150 what do you mean by 54% of 360 this is where you have to use your common sense now uh yes you know the moment you do the calculation you have a calculator available each one of you will get the answer but if i want to save time let us try to understand this and do this without using pen and paper now assume forget about 54% let's assume it is 50% what do you mean by 50% half what is half of 360 Half of 360 is 180. You'll all tell me. Quantity A is 180. Quantity B is 150. 50% itself is 180, which means your 54% will be greater than 180. So quantity A is something that is greater than 180, whereas quantity B is just 150. So which of these two is greater? It is, you know, uh, definitely it is quantity A that is greater. So your answer will become A. So these are called quantitative comparison questions. So now we'll we'll. understand more about this and the techniques involved when we get to the chapter but these are the kind of questions now there is no rule that your questions will only be from numbers your questions be could be from any topic you know any topic that you learn through your gre course it could be arithmetic it could be algebra it could be geometry it could be modern math it could be statistics anything right so this is what we meant by quantitative comparison the first type of question now let us look at the second type a simple mcq now mcq is something that uh, you all know something that you have been studying for all your life multiple choice question right this is a multiple select a single answer choice 
5 x plus 32 is equal to 4 minus 2 x. What is the value of x? So, before we get to the options, let us solve this. 5 x plus 32 is equal to 4 minus 2 x. 5 x plus 32 is equal to 4 minus 2 x. What is the value of x? So, let us solve. 2 x comes to this side becomes 5 x plus 2 x 7 x. So, 32 goes to the other side 4 minus 32. So, 7 x is equal to minus 28 x is equal to minus 4. So, a simple linear uh, equation in a single variable will solve it. So, the answer is minus 4. It will be A. This will be your answer. right? These are multiple choice. So, I, I do not think I need to explain in detail again. So, it is these are the simple questions. Uh, we will spend some time on the multiple answer questions because those are the different ones. right? Now, here is what I meant by multiple answers. A single question might have more than one correct answer. Now, if you look at this question, which of the following integers are multiples of both 2 and 3? Indicate all such integers. This is very important. When he is saying all, he is not saying there are 2 answers or 3 answers or 4 answers or 5 answers. You are your uh, job is to just select all the answers that are available. One important thing that you have to understand when you are solving such questions, multiple answer questions is that you have to cross check each and every option that is given. There is no other choice because you may not know if a given choice is the answer or not. It is not like multiple choice, for example, the previous one where we just solved and got the answer for x. Now, for any number or any integer to be multiple of 2 and 3, it has to be a multiple of 6 because 2 into 3 is 6. Just check out of these options which are multiples of 6. Is 8 a multiple of 6? No. Is 9 a multiple of 6? No. Is 12 a multiple of 6? Yes. So, C could be one of your answers. Then, is 18 your multiple of 6? Yes. C and D both are your answers. Is 21 a multiple of 6? No. Is 36 a multiple of 6? Yes. Which means, C is your answer, D is your answer and F is your answer. So, there are three answers. All possible answers are C, D and F. So, it is C, D and F. These are multiple answers. Now, sometimes... Uh, sometimes they might say all such digits, sometimes they might also say two answers or three answers, indicate the two options that are applicable or three options that are applicable. Just look at the question, but the important thing in these type of questions like I told you is to understand that each and every option has to be checked, there is no other choice. Now let us come to the fourth type of question, uh, the numeric entry question, now, something we uh, you know in our childhood, we learned this question as the fill in the blank. Question followed by a blank, you have to type the answer. right? Now, also understand sometimes in these questions, if the answer is let us say uh, a decimal, 32.5764, etc., etc. Now, he will clearly specify if you have to round it off to one digit or two digits or three digits. Now, your rounding off or your typing the answer has to be very, very clear or you know, uh, to what is being asked. If, is, if they say round it off to one digit, you have to round it off to one digit. If they say round it off to two digits, you have to round it off to two digits. If they say round it off to one digit after decimal, so based on what is asked, you have to type. Okay? For example, you know, these are the instructions. Make sure you answer the question what is asked. Sometimes units are also important. He might say type the answer in kilometers, whereas you might have got the answer in meters. So, you need to calculate meters first and then type. If you are asked to round your answer, make sure you round to the required accuracy. For example, if you are, if an answer of 46.7 is to round it to the nearest integer, you need to enter 47. If you enter 46, it is wrong. Okay. So, this is important. Let us look at, uh, you know, one or two example questions and then see. One pen costs rupees 25, not rupees, dollars 0.25 and one marker costs dollars 0.35. At those prices, what is the total cost of 18 pens and 100 markers? So, a pen cost me 0.25, a marker cost me 0.35, right? So, 18 pens and 100 markers. What is the cost? Clearly understand, he is asking the answer in dollars. This is very important. So, you have to convert your answer to dollars and see. Let us first calculate. So, 25.25 into 18, this is the total cost of pens plus 0.35 into 100. So, 0.35 into 100 is straightforward, it is 35, uh, two di the two points will go, it will be 35 plus 0.25 into 18. So, 25 into 18, if you calculate, you will get uh, 450 or 
nothing but 4.5. So 4.5 plus 35 is 39.5. Now here, since they are not asking you to round it off to any digit, you just have to enter whatever you get. You got 39.5, you have to type 39.5. Right? So 39.5, 0 or 39.5. In fact, equivalent decimals such are, these are also considered correct. So, somebody might type 39.5, somebody might type 39.500 or 0, all these are correct, don't worry. Now, in fact, clearly saying, note that the dollar symbol is in front of the answer box, so the symbol dollar does not uh, need to be entered in the box. In fact, only numbers have to be entered. So, and a negative sign can also be entered. If your answer is, for example, for some question, your answer is minus 2, minus 3, then you might also have to enter a negative sign. So, these are the four type of questions. So, just to recap, the MCQs, which are very simple, something that you have learned, the multiple answer questions, choose all or choose, you know, one or two, etc. Numeric entry, question followed by uh, a fill in the blank, a box, sometimes rounding off, sometimes if it is a fraction, you will have two blanks and the quantitative comparison. Two quantities are given, quantity A and quantity B, you have to find which is the answer. So, this is the pattern of the exam. So, starting from your number of sections, duration, calculator available, then uh, the scoring pattern, sectionally adaptive, uh, then the syllabus and the type of questions, right? This is about all the introduction. I hope, you know, it is pretty much clear and you might also have understood that it is not a very difficult exam, but you know, if you can put in the right kind of effort, scoring a 165, 170 is not very difficult, right? Now. Like I said, though there is a calculator available, it is very clearly told in the, you know, uh, in the ETS guide itself that majority questions won't need a calculator, which means uh, now within the available 35 minutes, you will have to solve those 20. Sometimes you might have a difficult topic. Sometimes you might have an easy topic. Questions might be of the same level. You know, if somebody is equally proficient in all the topics, it will be same. But if somebody is not very good at some topic and you might want to save a greater amount of time from that topic, what happens is you now have to do your calculations faster. Like I said, given an unlimited amount of time, each one of us will solve those 20 questions, you know, they are like that. But within the limited time constraint, you know, within that limited time of 35 minutes, if you want to solve this quickly, then calculation speed becomes a very important task. Not just this, you know, please understand that uh, a lot of times your brain tends to think faster if you can you know be faster in your calculations you know 2 into 3 is 6 6 into 2 is 12 7 into 3 is 21 all these are easy 10 table if i ask you what is 12 into 3 36 but what is 12 into 9 108 what is 17 into 8 17 into 9 etc etc so the moment your calculations become faster you know your brain tends to think faster it will also help you in each of the things that you do in your life you know whether it be math verbal you start thinking fast Another thing that you have to keep in mind, especially those who are not very comfortable with math, who think, you know, math is very tough or I am not very comfortable with numbers, please understand comfort with numbers will come only when you practice. You eat numbers, live numbers, drink numbers, as, you know, as simple as that. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, you know, let's say you are you're traveling in an auto to your college, just take two auto numbers and add. You know, that is how you, you tend to improve your calculation speed. Uh, it does not come, you know, uh, just as a jiffy, one night you sleep and uh, the next morning you wake up. It needs a lot of practice, right? So, for that I would suggest, uh, you know, learn tables up to 20. This is very, very important. So, go back home today, uh, pick up a book and write tables up to 20. If I ask you what is uh, 19 into 6, you can't think, you know, for, for a long time, 19 into 6 is... 114, you know, you have to be very, very fast within one or two seconds. Squares up to 30. So, when I say what is 25 square, what is 26 square, what is 28 square, what is 29 square and so on. Cubes up to 15. So, 12 cube, 11 cube. So, these three will immensely help you while you are doing calculations. Nobody is ask, going to ask you what is 26 square in the exam. But, you know, in, in the midst of some problem, you know, we might uh, make use of this 26 square. So, to be able to do your calculations faster, the first thing is learn tables up to 20, squares up to 30, and cubes up to 15. Then, apart from this, also learn reciprocals up to 1 by 20. Now, what do you mean by reciprocals? For example, if I say 1 by 2, what is 1 by 2? It is 
what is 1 by 4 it is 0.25 now you cannot take a lot of time to understand the moment I ask what is 1 by 4 you should say 0 0.25 uh, in the next second right similarly what is 1 by 10 0.1 1 by 15 1 by 16 1 by 18 1 by 19 up to 1 by 20 so this will immensely help you in problems because uh, in some problems you might uh, get an answer of let us say 1 by 7 but all the answer choices are given in percentages. So, how do you convert a fraction to a percentage? You cannot waste a lot of time. So, if you know 1 by 7 is 0 0.14, 0 0.14 means 14 percent. So, within a second you can get the answer. So, reciprocals also become important. Learn reciprocals starting from 1, 1 is obviously 1, 1 by 2, 1 by 3, 1 by 4 up to 1 by 20. Now, these things will definitely help you immensely while you are solving your problems. Right? So, another thing that will also help you is uh, this interconversion between a percentage, a fraction and a decimal, which means sometimes in the problem, uh, you know the entire problem in terms of parameters or variables could be in fractions, the answer choice could be in percentages or vice versa. The entire problem could be given in percentages, but the answer choices is in fractions or in decimals, etc. So, you cannot waste time in calculating one to the other etc etc. So, if you know the interconversion between these three, you can seamlessly convert one to the other and uh, other two, uh, fraction to decimal, decimal to fraction, percentage to decimal, percentage to do fraction etc etc. For example, if I say a fraction of 1 by 2, we know it is in decimals is 0.5, fractions is 50 percent. So, how do you convert a fraction to a decimal? Divide simply. How do you convert a fraction to a percentage? Multiply it with 100. How do you convert a percentage to a fraction? Divide with 100. For example, I say 40 percent. How do you convert 4, 40 by 100, or 4 by 10 or 2 by 5 or 0.4? So, interconversions are very important. Now, these interconversions you will be able to do faster, like I said, if you know reciprocals. So, which is why reciprocals become very important. So, interconversion between a percentage, a fraction and a decimal. This is also help you immensely with your percentages chapter. Right? So, write the interconversions quickly for let us say 30 percent. Then, uh, for example, 2 by 5, 2 by 5 is already there. So, let us say 30 percent, then 0 0.6, then uh, 1 by 20, write the interconversions for these three. One is in percentages, so convert it into fraction and decimal. One is in decimals, convert it into fraction and percentage. One it is in fractions, convert to a percentage and a decimal. Right? Hope you have done it. So, how do you convert 30 percent to fraction and decimal? For a fraction, divide it with 100, you will get fraction and then decimal. How do you convert 0 0.6 to a percentage? Multiply it with 100, right? How do you convert a fraction, third fraction into percentage? You can multiply it with 100, okay? Right. Now, let us start learning a few techniques now to improve our speed. Now, one thing that I want to make very, very clear, uh, please understand uh, what we are going to learn now is not, uh, you know, shortcut or some, you know, magic formula. It is derived from the way we do our math, the way we learnt our math in school, but we are trying to simplify some of the methods we learnt so that we can use them easily, right? So, do not be under the illusion that these are some magic formulae, uh, you know, they are lifted off from thin air, no. 
they are simply what we have done in school but we are learning them more efficiently now so right and don't ever get into this whole habit of uh, you know formula seeking etc because you will go nowhere okay so let's start with a basic 2 by 2 multiplication 2 by 2 multiplication we'll use something known as the criss cross method what do we mean by this for example i have 34 into 46 now what is the normal way of multiplication simple i'll start with 6 6 into 4 24 6 3 is 18 plus 2 20 then i'll start with 4 4 4 is a 16 1 4 3 is a 12 plus 1 13 right so this is 4 this is 6 this is 5 this is 1 so the answer is 1564 looks very simple but please understand is there a better or a simpler way of doing this let us try to understand now what are we doing in each step so before that let us understand the place values this is your uh, units digit units means ones digit this is the tens digit tens place units place now finally in your answer 1564 this is your ones place this is your tens place this is hundreds this is thousands right so we have my number ones place and tens place uh, we have the answer which has ones tens hundreds etc right let us try to understand what it is So, if there are two numbers A, B, and C, D, B and D are the ones place, A and C are the tens place. And finally, when you want to get the answer, please understand in the answer it will also have ones place. Now, when will you get a ones place in the answer? Only when you multiply the ones place and ones place in both the numbers. So, what are the ones and ones in both the numbers? B and D. So, draw a diagram like this; it will be easy to understand. So, we'll first multiply B and D. So, it will become the answer will become the ones place will be B D. then second after the ones place in the answer we'll go to the tens place what is the tens place how do you get a tens place in the answer either i multiply the ones here with the tens here or the tens here with the ones here which means in both cases i get a tens place which means cross multiply and add so your second step is cross multiply and add a into d plus b into c because a into d will give you a tens place b into c will also give you a tens place because this is Tens place into ones place is tens place. Tens place into one place is ten. So this second digit will be AD plus BC. Then finally, the answer will have hundreds place. How do you get a hundreds place? Tens into tens, A into C. This is your diagram. This is A into C. Which means the same multiplication which we have used two different steps. For example, we first multiplied with six and then with four. can now be combined and done in a single calculation using this these are the three steps so let's understand it in little more detail uh, we'll get to the answer very quickly now you can observe this also this also is easy to understand how did we get this 4 when we multiplied this 4 into 6 this was 4 how did we get this 20 how did we get this 20 and 36 we are adding 20 and 36 20 is when we multiplied 6 and 3 uh, this 36 was when multiplied 4 and 4 you got 6 so we are adding these two and finally 3 into 4 right which means a 2 by 2 multiplication can be done much faster following these three steps let us do 34 into 46 now again the first step always start from the rightmost digits multiply the digits in the rightmost places b and d here 4 and 6 4 6 that 24 2 will be your carry over this is the first step done the second step cross multiply and add so from the right side we are slowly moving towards the left side we took the rightmost digits multiplied them then we'll to call the four digits cross multiply and add a into d plus b into c so 3 into 6 plus 4 into 4 what is 3 into 6 18 plus 4 into 4 is 16 18 plus 16 34 34 plus there was a carry over of 2 34 plus 2 36 so 6 will be here now my new carry over will be 3 So the third step is so from the right we are slowly moving towards the left b into d then cross multiply and add then finally a into c 3 into 4 12 12 plus 3 15 3 was carry over so your answer is 1564 the same as previous now instead of doing it in two separate steps we were able to do it in one single step so remember the diagram always start from the right side multiply the digits in the units place Then cross multiply and add. Then multiply the digits in the tens place. 
Uh, you might say both are, you know, take the same amount of time. But please understand, we can extend the same method to a 3 by 3, a 4 by 4, etc, etc. Where we will be able to save a lot of time. So please remember this. We will extend this to kind of 3 by 3 and then uh, solve a few problems. So 3 by 3, unlike a 2 by 2, we will now have 5 steps. Right. So, for example, 234 into 365. Let's say this is my calculation. The, you know, it is same like 2 by 2. Forget about, for example, these two are not present. Let's say it is 34 into 65. How would you do? Start with the digits in the units place. 4 into 5, 20. 2 is your carryover. Then, same process. Cross multiply the last two digits and add. 3 5s are 15. 4 6s are 24. 24 plus 15, 39 plus 39 plus 2 a carry over 41. So, 1 will be here, 4 will be your carry. Now, from the third step, it will slightly vary. The third step is now, look at this diagram. Cross multiply the extremes. That means 2 into 5, 3 into 4 and then cross multiply the middle ones or multiply the middle ones. 2 into 5 is 10, 3 into 4 is 12, 10 plus 12, 22, then 3 into 6, 18. Uh, so, we have 18, we have 3, 6 is 18, 3, 4 is 12, plus we have 2 into 5, 10. So, 18 plus 12 is 30, plus 10, 40, plus there was a carryover of 4, 44. This is 4 again, finally. And then, like I said, in even in the 2 by 2, we start from the right side, slowly move towards the left. So, we started here, we looked at these two, then we looked at these two, then we took all the three, now we will take only these two. So, cross multiply these two, 2, 6 is 12, plus 3, 3 is a 9, 12 plus 9, 21 plus 4, 25. So, 2 is your carrier. And finally, 2 into 3, 6, 6 plus 2, 8. This is your answer. So, as simple as this, a 2 by 2 can be extended to a 3 by 3. Not very new. F remember this diagram, it will become very easy. So, units place, multiply the units place, then cross multiply and add the last two, then cross multiply the extremes and multiply the middle ones, then cross multiply the digits, these two, etc. Right? H5410. We will do one more example, then it will be much more clear to you. 364 into 742. Right. Like I said, let me use different colors so that uh, you understand this easily. The first one is 4 into 2. 4 into 2 is 8. Then, so this is my first step. What was my second step? Let me use brown now. Second step is these two. Cross multiply and add. 6 2 is a 12 plus 4 4 is a 16. So 12 plus 16 is 28. So I have a carry over of 2. Then the third step is 2 2. Take all the 3. I am using green color. So what is the third step? Cross multiply the extremes, multiply the middle ones. Which means 3 into 2 6. 6 plus 7 into 4, 28 plus 6 into 4, 24. So, 28 plus 24 is 52 plus 6, 58 plus there was a carryover of 2, 60. So, this will be 6. The fourth step. So, let us use one more color. Let us use yellow color for example. We will take these two. Right? So, it is 3 into 4 and 6 into 7. So, the fourth step is this. 3 into 4 is 12 plus 7 into 6 is 42. 42 plus 12 is 54. 54 there was a carryover of 6, it is 60. So, carryover of again 6. So, 54 plus 6 is again 60. So, 6. Finally, 3 into 7. Let us get back to black. 3 into 7 is 21. 21 plus 6, 27. So, your answer is 270088. Right? So, remember this diagram. Start from the right side, multiply the units place, then cross multiply the rightmost two, then cross multiply extremes, multiply the middle ones, and so on. Right? 
now just solve this problem 378 into 846 then uh, 444 into 666 then 946 into 12 then 98 into 64 do these three take 5 minutes and solve
right so hope you had the time to solve it's just a simple process follow the steps and you you'll easily get the answer okay so let's just look at what the answer for each one of them is 378 into 846 i hope you got the answer as 319788 then we have 444 into 666 the answer might have been 295704 now this is an interesting one 946 into 12 now how would you do 946 into 12 please understand for this we would not need any special methods because the moment we know 12 table you can simply say 12 6 is 72 uh, 12 4 is 48 plus 7 55 12 9 108 uh, 12 9 is 108 plus 5 113 so the moment you know tables so there is a limit to the methods as well you know for the method we learned the moment you know tables you don't need to you know uh, go back add a zero probably and do a 3 by 3 all that is not required because you know the table so please in your own mind fix limits up to uh, till what limit can i use this methods and till what limit can i use not use this methods right and finally 98 into 64 uh, you might have the got the answer is 60 to 70 so go home practice a lot more just take random numbers have a calculator by the side do the calculation find the answer and this will become a habit like i told you for about you know 20 years you have learned uh, doing these calculations in one method now suddenly i am asking you to do it in a different method it won't work so it will become a habit only when you start doing this so even in your exams uh, in your college exams if you find some numbers like these 3 by 3 4 by 4 uh, i hope uh, you will do you will you know do, use these methods to uh, do it much more better okay so only then it will become a habit so 2 by 2 3 by 3 this is called a criss cross method right now let us uh, go to the next one called base multiplication or base method now what do you mean by this quite a few times in uh, in your own uh, mathematical problems uh, percentages etc etc for example uh, there is a rectangle it has a length it has a width the length increases by 8% the width increases by 6% by what percent will the area increase let's say this is a question so the way to solve this problem is you'll assume length is x width is y so the area is length into width x into y what is the new length so x plus 8% increase 8 by 100 into x and so on etc you'll find this and find will find the area now if you carefully understand at the end of the day to find the increase in area you will end up multiplying 108 or 1.08 into 1.06 which means 108 into 106 in other words these are numbers that are close to 100 now what is the speciality of 100 any multiplication with 100 is easy 100 into 2 200 100 into 5 500 100 into 15 1500 you don't need to do any calculation add two zeros at the end of the number you are done which means multiplication with 100 often gives us a leeway or an advantage in terms of comfort so let us uh, understand that whenever there are numbers that are close to a base a base is nothing but a number that ends with zeros a base could be 10 a base could be 100 a base could be 1000 so how can we easily do this right so let us do 108 into 106 now the traditional way of doing this is let's say 100 into 8 plus into sorry 100 plus 8 into 100 plus 6 right now first is 100 into 100 100 into 100 is 10 power 4 plus 100 into 6 plus 100 into 8 so if you take 100 common it is 8 plus 6 and finally 8 into 6 if you understand this a little more closely if you observe this a little more closely you'll understand the 10 power 4 will be common for any multiplication that is of two numbers that are close to 100 so this 10 power 4 is common this 100 is also common so what changes only these two so this 8 and 6 may be different for different multiplications so from this we can derive that multiplication of two numbers that are close to a base like 100 or 1000 can be done very very easily using this process called the base multiplication method for that you need to identify two things a and b a and b are nothing but surplus or deficit of the first number what do you mean by surplus by how much is this number greater than 100 or by how, how much is this number less than 100 so 
A is plus 8 because it is 8 more than 100 and B is plus 6, plus 8 and plus 6. So, A and B, let us define A and B. So, 108 into 106, we have defined A and B, A is plus 8, B is plus 6. So, the answer to this question is, it will have three parts to the answer, 1, A plus B and AB. So, start from here, what is A into B? It is 8 into 6, 48. What is A plus B? 8, 6, 6, 14 and 1. So, your answer is 1, 1, 4, 4, 8, as simple as this. So, please understand this is what we have learnt here. This is A plus B, this is A into B. So, if you have any two numbers that are close to 100, how do we do this multiplication? First define A and B. A and B are surplus or deficit of the given numbers. By how much is it greater than 100? By how much is it less than 100? A is plus 8 and B is plus 6. 1, A plus B and A B. Right? So, A plus B is 14, AB. So, 1, 1, 4, 4, 8 is your answer. So, without, in fact, without doing any calculation, you can get this answer. Just by saying 8 and 6, 8, 6 is 48, 8 plus 6 is 14 and 1. Right? This is how simple these calculations are. Now, there are certain rules that need to be followed here, certain exceptions rather. Uh, we we'll look at each of those exceptions one by one. Now, the first rule. Let us come to the first rule. Note them down while I am writing. For example, I have 102 into 103. So, A is plus 2, B is plus 3. So, what will be the answer? 1, A plus B is 5, A into B is 6. Now, but can the answer be 156? Obviously not. When you are multiplying two three-digit numbers, the answer can't be a three-digit number. Which means, this brings us to the first exception of the rule. The two parts, there are three parts to the answer, 1, A plus B and A, B. The two parts, A plus B and A, B, which means, the last parts except the first part or let us say except the first part. All the other parts except the first part should have as many digits as the number of zeros in the base. Read this carefully. All the other parts except the first part should have as many digits as the number of zeros in the base. Here our base is 100 for both of them. 100 is how many zeros? Two zeros. Which means except the first part, these two parts should have two digits. Not more than two, not less than two. Exactly two. But in this case, how many digits do they have? One, one each. So, what should we do? It's the next exception. The first rule is, all the other parts except the first part should have as many digits as the number of zeros in the base. Note it down. For example, if you are doing a, you know, uh, a multiplication like 1002 into 1003. So, here the base is 1000, so it will have three zeros. So, three zeros will be uh, here. Okay. Right. Let us go to the second rule now. So the first rule was number of zeros. Now what about the second rule? The second rule says if for some reason in any calculation there are number of digits is less than what is required. Now in this case I need two digits here, two digits here, but I have only one digit. Then, the second rule says prefix zeros. So, that the value does not change. Wherever you have less than the required number of digits, you just have to prefix zeros in those parts. Prefixing means adding zeros. The answer now becomes 10506. The second rule is prefixing zeros. Let us come to the third rule. For example, I am doing 109 into 112. So, what is A? Plus 9, 9 greater. What is B plus 12? It is 12 greater than 100. So, my answer is 1 A plus B A B. So, what is A into B? 12 into 9, 108. 12 plus 9, 21 and 1. So, this is fine. 21, 2 digits. My base is 100. 2 zeros, 2 digits. But here, there are 3 digits. What should I do? Go back to your school. For example, I am doing 85 into 79. When it is 5 plus 9, 14, this extra 1 was carried over. The same logic will be followed here. 
when you have more than what is required you will carry to the immediate left part this one is extra so we will have 0 8 here 1 goes here 1 plus 21 is 22 so the answer is 1 2 2 0 8 so the third rule is carry very very similar to what you have done in school so always carry will be to the left side so for example if you have a carry in this part it will be to this side if you have a carry in this part it will be to this side so carry will happen only when we have more than what is required so the third rule is carry right now let us look at the fourth rule For example, I am doing 94 into 107. So, A is minus 6 because it is 6 less than 100. Deficit B is plus 7. So, 1 A plus B A into B. What is A into B? Minus 6 into plus 7 minus 42. A plus B is minus 6 plus 7 is plus 1 and finally 1. Now, look at this very, very carefully. 1 plus 1 and minus 42. Now, here obviously there is a problem, there is only one digit, here there is a negative. Obviously negative can't be your answer. The same logic, what did you did in school? Let's say uh, I am subtracting 69 from 74. What did you do? You can't subtract 9 from 4, so you borrowed, it becomes 14. Same logic will be followed here. So minus 40 is not valid, borrow. Now since these operations are with respect to 100, which means the base is 100, Borrowing means we are always borrowing 100. So, 100 minus 42 is 58. Now, there was 1 here. You borrowed that one. What will remain? It will be 0. So the fourth rule is borrow. So, 1, 0, 1. Now, so 2 digits because my base is 100, 2 zeros, 2 digits. This part is absolutely fine. What about this part? Now, this part has only 1 digit 0. But what does my first rule say? It should have as many digits as the number of zeros in the base. My number of zeros is 2, so it will have 2 digits. So, we have to prefix zeros. The answer is 10058. Right? Now, if you want to borrow for here, borrow from here, borrow from here. Same as what we did in math in our childhood. Carry is to the left side, borrow is also from the left side. Okay. Then let us look at the fifth rule. Let's say I am doing 206 into 207. Now here, obviously, these numbers are not close to 100, obviously, but they are close to a, a multiple of 100. What do you mean by a multiple of 100? Here the multiple of 100 is 2. Because uh, 200 is a multiple of 100, they are close to 200. Same define as the A is plus 6 because it is 6 more than 200, B is plus 7. Apart from A and B, we will also define a new parameter called N. Then is which multiple of 100? 200 is what? The second multiple of 100. Right? Now, the same process will be followed. 1, A plus B, AB. So, 6 into 7, 42. 6 plus 7, 13, 1. The only difference here is after this is done, we will do something known as adjustment. So, the fifth rule is adjustment. What do you mean by adjustment? Since it is not 100 but 200, we will start multiplying from the leftmost side. This part will multiply with n square, this part with n power 1, this part with n power 0. Which means multiply this part with 2 square, this with 2 power 1, this with 2 power 0. Which means the answer becomes 1 into 2 square is 4, first part will be 4, 2 into 13 is 26, 2 power 0 is 1, 1 into 42 is 42. So does it violate any of the rules? Since the base is still 100, it, it has two zeros, so two digits, two digits, so the answer is 42642. So the fifth rule is adjustment. When do we do adjustment? Adjustment is done when we are multiplying numbers that are not close to 100, but are close to a multiple of 100. So define n, n square, n power 1, n power 0. Right? Now, sometimes in the same problem, you might have to do adjustment, you might have to do carry, you might have to do borrow. So, in which order do we follow? So, please understand if you have to do borrow, carry, etc., etc., the order always must be uh, A, B, C. So, something like your alphabets. A stands for adjustment, B stands for borrow, C stands for carry. So, always do adjustment first, only then borrow and carry. Right? So, if you have less than uh, 
more than the required number of digits. Before you even carry, first do adjustment and then carry. Okay, ABC is the order of operation. Right, these are the five rules. Now, take some examples. Uh, 94 into 97, 93 square, 105 square, it is uh, 113 into 117, 91 into 90. Do this, take two minutes and do this. So let's solve these questions. 94 into 97 should be very easy for you. A is minus 6, B is minus 3, right? So 1, A plus B minus 6 minus 3 is minus 9, minus 6 into minus 3 is 18. This part is fine because two digits, your base is 100. This part is not proper. So which rule is violated? Borrow. Now borrow. 100 minus 9. So 18, 81. So, there was one, we borrowed that one, nothing will remain here. So, your answer is 81, 18. A very simple question. So, always define first A and B. A is minus 6, B is minus 3. Then do your 1A plus B, AB. Next, 93 square. So, what is 93 square? A is minus 7, 
B is also minus 7 because 93 square is nothing but 93 into 93. Same process 1 minus 7 minus 7 is minus 14 minus 7 into minus 7 is plus 49. So 100 minus 14 is 86 49. 1 was there we borrowed 1 so nothing will remain 86 14. The third one is 105 square again same process is 105 into 105 a is 5 b is also 5. So 1 a plus b 5 plus 5 is 10 a into b is 25. It must be a very simple question 11025. Next 113 into 117 a is 13 b is 17 1 a plus b 13 plus 17 is 13 a into b 17 is 13. So 170 plus 51 221. Now which rule is violated? I need only two digits because my base is 100. You have to carry this extra 2 has to be carried. 21 here, 2 plus 30 is 32 and 1. Now if it is all fine, so the answer is 13221. Right? So always once you do 1 a plus b a b, look for what is the issue. Is the issue with carry, is the issue with borrow, then accordingly solve your problem. Then 91 into 90, a is minus 9, b is minus 10. So 1, a plus b, a b. So a into b, minus 9 into minus 10 is plus 90, minus 9 minus 10 is minus 19, 1. So 100 minus 19 is 81. 81, 90. Right? So even for squares, you don't need a special method. When I say 105 square, 106 square, it is nothing but 106 into 106. A and B would be C. Right? Uh, let us learn one more and uh, then kind of revise. Now, for example, if I am doing uh, 15 into 15 or 24 into 26 or 36 into 34. Now, or 43 into 47. What is special about all these products? If you look at all these products, there are two things. The first thing is the sum of the digits in the units place is 10. 5 plus 5 is 10, 4 plus 6 is 10, 6 plus 4 is 10, 3 plus 7. So units digit sum is equal to 10. Second, the other thing is the digits in the the rest of the digits rather. So if you leave out the units place 6 and 4, 5 and 5, the rest of the digits are same. Here it is 2 and 2, here it is 4 and 4, here it is 3 and 3, here it is 1 and 1. So if these two criteria are satisfied by any two numbers, the product will have two parts. Part A, part B. It is a very simple product. Part B is very simple. Part B is nothing but multiply the digits in the units place. Units place is 5 into 5, 25 here. For example, here it will be 4 into 6, 24. Here it is 6 into 4, 24. Here it is 7 into 3, 21. So part B is nothing but multiply the digits in the units place. Part A is nothing but other than the units digit we said, what is the rest of the digits? Here the rest of the digit is 1. Here it is 2. Here it is 3, here it is 4. So take the rest of the digit, multiply it with the next number. So here the rest of digit is 1. Next number to 1 is 2. So 1 into 2 is 2. Then here, rest of the digits are 2. 2 into 3, because 3 is this next number. Here 3 is the rest of the digits, 3 into 4. So here is 4 into 5. So the answer is 1 into 2 is 2, 225 for the first one. 2 into 3 is 6, 624 for the second one. 3 into 4 is 12, 1224 for the third one. 4 into 5 is 20, 20, 21 for the first one. Right? You might ask me where will I get this and why should I remember all this. Please understand this criteria will be very very useful when you are finding squares of numbers. For example, 25 square, 25 into 25. Let us look at the two criteria. Sum of the digits in the units place, 10, 5 plus 5, rest of the digits are same. Which means finding the square of numbers that end in 5 is very very simple using this. So let us start with 15 square. Now. Another thing with this is the units digit in any number ending with 5, if you are finding square, they will always be 5 and 5. 15 square is 15 into 15. 25 square is 25 into 25, which means part B 
is nothing but sum of my digits in the units place. Part B is always 25 because it is always 5 into 5. So I can simply say the answer last two digits are always 25. What about the previous digits? It is 1 into its next number. 1 into its next number is 2. 1 into 2 is 2. So 225 is the answer. Similarly, 25 is always there. 2 into its next number. 2 into 3 is 6. Similarly, 35 square. 25 is always there. 3 into its next number 12. 1225. 65 square for example. 25 is there. 6 into its next number. 6 7 is a 42. 95 square. 25. 9 into its next number 10. It is 90. So like this. So finding the squares of numbers, the 10 in 5 is very, very simple, right? So more or less, these are the methods. Again, like I'm telling you, this will not be useful unless they become part of your habit, which means in your system, the way you used to do certain calculations have to change, this should become your habit. So let us just revise what we learned. So we started with the crisscross method, 2 by 2 multiplication. So remember this diagram, you will be able to do much better. Start with the units place, start from the right, go towards the left. Then we expanded the same to a 3 by 3, right, 5 steps. Then we learnt uh, uh, the base multiplication, so the 5 rules. What are the 5 rules? Number of digits should be equal to number of zeros in the base. Second one is prefix, carry, borrow and adjustment, right. And finally we learnt uh, multiplying square of numbers that end in 5, okay. Uh, so these methods, see, to, if you want to learn, there are thousands and hundreds of methods, but all of them uh, won't be useful for your GRE and also, you know, remembering all of them is also little difficult. So these are optimum and more than enough. Uh, a few things that I want to tell you, one is obviously practice, take, you know, random examples, go back, practice and do a lot more practice. The second thing is, Everything that we do as part of our uh, syllabus in GRE Quant, please understand, not just GRE Quant, but math as, as such, this is something that happens in front of your eyes. A lot of people go wrong in math because they believe, you know, uh, the real life has no relation to what we are doing in math. For example, I will give you an example. Most of you will go shopping, right? So, none of you will carry a calculator to the shopping. So, for example, uh, 9.99 is the price of a shirt and the he is offering a 25% discount and even before, you know, even without using a calculator etc, your mind will do the calculation. So 999 is close to 1000, so 25% of 1000 is 250, 250 rupees discount means the bill should be close to 750. So if the bill is not close to 750, you will fight with him. Now the same thing, let's say it is converted into a problem. Arun went to a shop, he saw a shirt which is worth 999, there is a 25% discount on it, what is the final price? I'm sure people will waste half a page for this. Now, is there any difference in the numbers? There is no difference in the numbers. There is no difference in the calculation. But why are we, why is our mind responding in two different ways in two different scenarios? Because it is all with to do with the mindset. So, in a, wherever you are interested, wherever you can connect math to real life, you will do much better. Same goes with most of you know, if you have bikes, you go to a petrol bunk and you will see if I take petrol for 40 rupees, I will get let's say half a litre, half a litre is good enough for me to travel 20 kilometres. But the same thing converted to a problem, I have a bike, the petrol costs 80, if the mileage is so much, how long can I travel, a time speed distance problem, again you list half a page. So please understand math is something that happens in front of you, if you can relate problems to your real life, that is when you can do much better. So what needs to be changed is mindset and a little bit of practice. So there is none of you who can, you know, you need not be scared of math even if you did not study math after 10th because it's just cool math that we are studying. Please go back home, uh, do a lot of practice of what we have learned today and also, you know, uh, what is GRE quant in all and you have a very bright chance of scoring that 160, 170. I hope all of you will do this. Uh, you know, before I end, I just want to repeat, maths is easy provided we put in the effort. Maths becomes difficult if you don't have comfort with numbers, you need to have comfort with numbers. Wake up with numbers, sleep with numbers, drink numbers, eat numbers, right? Thank you.